Hi, welcome to iEducator. This is Teacher Jeff. I'm an educator and an engineer by profession. And today, we will discuss Chapter 7. And Chapter 7 is all about the collection of data. Now, in today's lesson, there are three key areas that I'm going to be highlighting today. First, we will be discussing the different classifications of data according to source. Second, we will also be tackling selecting the method of data collection. And finally, we will also be covering the research instruments or tools. Now, in order for us to get started, let us first discuss our first key area of our lesson. And that would be the classification of data according to source. So what is meant by data then? Well, data, plural for datum, refers to the collection of numbers, okay? The quantities, facts or records used as a basis for drawing conclusions or making inferences. Now, with this definition, we can tell that data are what research is searching for and which are subjected to analysis, statistical procedures, and interpretation so that inferences, principles, or generalizations are drawn. Now, data also reveal unsatisfactory conditions that need to be improved. For example, the application of newly discovered facts and principles to remedy unsatisfactory conditions becomes the basis of human progress and the improvement of the quality of human life. Now, the classifications of data according to source, first, we have the primary data, and second, we also have the secondary data. Now, in order for us to better understand each of these classifications, let us discuss them one by one, starting with the primary data. So what is meant by primary data then? If we say primary data, these are those gathered from primary sources. So the primary sources are individual persons, we also have organized groups or organizations such as associations, fraternities, schools, business firms, the church, army, navy, air force, government. We also have lawmaking bodies, family, and tribe. Okay. Now, another primary data example that would be established practices as well, such as marriage, we have religious rights, we have the legal system, okay, we also have economic system, democracy, and the system of morals. And under primary data, uh, we also have documents in their original forms. If I say documents in their original forms, I'm referring to the constitution, laws, orders, proclamations, treaties, contracts, census, and all kinds of original records, letters, diaries, etc. So these are examples of documents in their original form. Another that can be considered as primary source or primary data are the living organisms such as the animals, souls, and lower forms of living organisms as well. Aside from that, we can also um, consider man-made material things as primary data, such as buildings, machines, weapons, artifacts, appliances, roads, bridges. We have dams, radio, television, electricity, etc. And finally, we also have natural objects and phenomena. These are also considered as primary data. Examples of these are rain, we have wind, we have typhoon, water, earthquake, mountain, snow, etc. So in other words, data from the last three sources. So we have um, living organisms, okay? We also have man-made materials, okay? We have their living organisms, man-made materials, and finally, we have 
natural objects and phenomena. So data from the last three sources are nonverbal or concrete data. And another classification of data according to um, source, that would be secondary data. If it's a secondary data, these are those gathered from secondary sources. The secondary sources are books, okay? And books include dictionaries, encyclopedias, almanacs, etc. Another considered a secondary data are articles published in professional journals, magazines, newspapers, and other publications. Also, we have unpublished master's thesis and dissertations and other studies. And we also have monographs, manuscripts, etc. And finally, we have all other secondhand sources. Now, if your data from the last three sources of your primary data are nonverbal, now the secondary data are considered verbal or written data. Now, the advantages of primary data over secondary data, first, the primary data frequently give detailed definitions of terms and statistical units used in the survey. And second, the secondary data have usually little or no explanatory notes and may contain clerical and typographical mistakes, which often arise from transcription of the figures from the original and primary source. And third advantage, the primary data usually includes a copy of the schedule and a description of the procedure used in the selection of the type of sample and in collecting the data. So this gives the user an idea of accuracy, applicability, and limitations of the survey results. And finally, the primary data are usually broken down into finer classifications. So the secondary data often omit part of combining categories, such as showing barriers instead of CPOs, or municipalities instead of barrios. So these are the advantages of primary data over secondary data. On the other hand, the advantages of secondary data. So first we have secondary data are more convenient to use because they are already condensed and organized, okay? Second, analysis and interpretation are done more easily as well here in secondary data. And finally, libraries make secondary data more easily accessible as well, because the moment you step in the library, there are a lot of secondary data accessible there, all right? So the categories of data according to, or the categories of data gathered from respondents, so take note that respondents are those individuals who are asked or requested by a researcher to supply data or information about his research problem. Now, the categories of data supplied by respondents are, first, we have facts. And facts are recollections, observations, and perceptions of respondents about themselves and of other people. For example, we have personal circumstances, and also we have what they do, okay? Another category of data gathered from respondents, aside from facts, we also have attitudes and feelings, okay? We also have judgment. We have psychomotor skills, result of tests and experiments, and we also have all other data gathered from the primary and secondary sources of data. If we say personal circumstances, they include age, sex, height, the weight, the color of skin and eyes, the color and nature of hair, facts about health, date of birth of the respondent, place of birth, civil status, number of children, the present address, the kind of residence and residence environment, the telephone numbers, the nationality, the race, the ethnic group, the native language spoken, and other languages spoken as well, education and school, intelligence, 
character and other psychological characteristics. So these are the inclusions of personal circumstances. And also under facts, we have what they do, such as the habits and habits of the respondents, the profession or occupation, the lifestyle, plans and aspirations, the social or economic status, membership in religion, professional or civic organizations, activities, practices, and other events in their lives. And also, another category of data gathered from respondents, we have attitudes and feelings. So what do we mean by this? These are the respondents' ideas and thoughts about the research topic and his personal feelings about the worth of the item being investigated. So this may include the extent of the respondents' attitudes and feelings toward the issues or state of affairs raised in the research problem. So in order for us to better understand this, let me give you an example. So for example, if a respondent is asked to give his attitude or reaction toward pornography, he may say strongly agree to, favors it, or he merely agrees to, favors or likes it, or he may say that he is not sure of his opinion, that is, he is uncertain, or he merely disagrees to or disfavors, dislikes or hates it, or strongly disagrees to, disfavors, dislikes or hates it. Okay, that's an example of the respondents' attitudes and feelings. Another, we have what we call judgments. If we say judgments, these data include the respondents' ideas or opinion about or his actual behavior in a given situation. So this is what the respondents think a thing or a situation may be, should be, or what is. Now, in this, there seems to be a standard an ideal standard that is with which things, ideas, and situations are being compared and how far or how near they are from the standard. Now, in order for us to better understand what judgment is, now let me give you an example. So, for example, if a respondent is asked how serious a problem is, he may answer very serious, serious, slightly serious not serious or not at all a problem according to his judgment. So one may say a flower is ugly by comparing it with what he knows to be a beautiful flower. We often hear of students being granted honors because their performance has been found to be superior to the performance of average students, right? We also often hear of judgments rendered by trial courts and juries board of judges in public speaking contests, singing contests, beauty contests, and the like. So in rendering these judgments, there were standards used, all right? And also we have psychomotor skills. So what do we mean by psychomotor skills? So these data refer to the manipulative skills of the individual and his activities that involve his five senses, the sight, the hearing, the taste, the smell, and the touch. So with this in mind, we would ask the question, how skillful does one operate a microscope? How well does he respond to sound, to touch? So in here, there is actually an element of judgment because the performance of an individual is usually judged in comparison of or with the performance of an average individual. And also we have results of tests and experiments. Now in here, the results of tests and experiments are very important data, especially in psychology and in physical, chemical and biological sciences. So why is that so? Because much of the progress of mankind is actually due to the results of tests and experiments performed in connection with research, correct? Now, that being said, the psychological principles that we are applying today have been the results of extensive testing. And the potent drugs, for example, for the cure of different ailments 
have been the results of biological research testing, right? Also, we have the electricity, the engine, the airplane, the car, the telephone, the sewing machine, and the countless other inventions that are giving convenience and comfort to all mankind have been the results of painstaking experiments in the physical science. And finally, the last category of data gathered from respondents are all other data gathered from the primary and secondary sources of data. Right, so this is all about the first key area of our lesson. That would be the classification of data according to source. Now, moving on to the next key area of our lesson, that would be the selecting the method of collecting the data. Now, there are actually several ways of collecting data, among which are the following. First, we have the clerical tools. And second, we have the mechanical devices. Under clerical tools, we have the questionnaire method, the interview method, the empirical observation method, the registration method, the testing method, the experimental method, and the library method as well. Now, in order for us to better understand this, uh, let us discuss them one by one, starting with the questionnaire method. Now, under questionnaire method, take note that a questionnaire um, has been defined as a list of planned written questions related to a particular topic with space provided for indicating the response to each question intended for submission to a number of persons for reply and commonly used in normative survey um, studies and in the measurement of attitudes and opinions. Now, this being said, in other words, a questionnaire method is simply a set of questions which, when answered properly by a required number of properly selected respondents, will actually supply the necessary information to complete a research study. And the questionnaire is commonly used in behavioral research or social research as well. Now, another method of data collection is what we call the interview method and take note the interview is one of the major techniques in gathering data or information right now if we say um, interview it is defined as a purposeful face-to-face -face relationship between two persons as you can notice in our sample um, images or pictures one of whom called the interviewer who asks questions to gather information and the other one called the interviewee or the respondent who supplies the information asked for. And another method of data collection, uh, we have the empirical observation method. Now, if we say observation as a means of gathering information for research, um, maybe defined as perceiving data through the use of our senses, the sense of sight, hearing, taste, touch and smell now the sense of sight is the most important and most used among all senses and observation is the most direct way and the most widely used in studying behavior and another method of data collection is what we call the registration method and take note that registration is a process of listing down items of the same kind in some systematic manner for record purposes. And registered matter may be classified alphabetically, chronologically, qualitatively, quantitatively, or otherwise. Now, in order for us to better understand the registration method, let me provide you an example. So for example, take the enrollment in a certain school, for instance, okay? So the students, may be listed down alphabetically or chronologically by year as first, second, third, or fourth year, qualitatively by course as BSE or BSN, okay, BSN or BSIE, and so on and so forth, or quantitatively by listing down first the course with the highest enrollment, followed by the course with the second highest enrollment and so on and so forth, okay? So that is an example of the registration method. And another method of data collection is what we call 
the testing method. Now, if we see test, it, it is defined as a specific type of measuring instrument whose general characteristic is that it forces responses from a pupil and the responses are considered to be indicative of the pupil's skill, knowledge, attitudes, etc. Now, some examples are true false test, essay examination, attitude scales, short answer tests, midterms, finals, personality inventory, and many others. All right. So these are examples of testing method. And also we have the library method. So the library method is when you make use, you utilize the sources that are provided by your school library. And finally, the last method of data collection, I was not able to put it here, but there is another one method of data collection. And that is what we call the experimental method, okay? So what do we mean by experimental method then? If we see experimental method of research, it, is, uh, it refers to a method or procedure involving the control or manipulation of conditions for the purpose of studying the relative effects of various treatments applied to members of a sample or the same treatment applied to members of different samples as well. Now, in experimental method, you need to have your variables of the study. You should have your independent variable or the cause and also your dependent variables or the effects, okay? Because you are doing experiments. So these are the different methods of data collection. And the next key area of our uh, lesson for today that would be the research instruments or tools that we actually employ if we do researches. So the instruments or tools for gathering data in research are of two categories of kinds. First, we have the mechanical devices. And second, we have the clerical tools. Now, in order for us to better understand each of them, let us discuss them one by one, starting with the mechanical devices. So if we say mechanical devices, they include almost all tools such as the microscopes, the telescopes, thermometers, rulers, and monitors used in the physical sciences. So in the social sciences and nursing, mechanical devices include such equipment as tape recorders, okay? We also have cameras, film and videotape as well. And in addition, Included also are the laboratory tools and equipment used in experimental research in the chemical and biological sciences, as well as in industry and agriculture. And finally, the last category or kind of instruments or tools for gathering data, we have what we call clerical tools. And clerical tools are used when the researchers studies people and gathers data on the feelings emotions, the attitudes, and judgments of the objects. Examples of clerical tools, we have filed records, we have histories, case studies, questionnaires, and interview schedules as well. All right, so the characteristics of a good research instrument, first, the instrument must be valid and reliable. So what do we mean by this? If we say valid and reliable, an instrument is valid if it collects data which are intended for it to collect and long enough to be able to collect adequate information to complete the study or investigation. It is reliable, on the other hand, if it is administered to the same subject twice without any practice, it also gives the same result or measure. And second, it must be based upon the conceptual framework or what the researcher wants to find out. Now, a conceptual framework is the researcher's idea or expectation of what a situation should be, but he is not providing his idea or expectation to be true. So he is only finding out if it is true or not. And third characteristic of a good research instrument 
it must gather data suitable for and relevant to the research topic. This means to say that data foreign or extraneous to the study or topic should not be gathered by the instrument. For instance, if the topic is about the teaching of science, then, then the instrument should gather data only about the teaching of science and not for the teaching of English, if that makes sense, okay? Now, fourth, it must gather data that would test the hypothesis or answer the questions under investigation. So testing a hypothesis, say note, is merely finding out whether it is true or not based upon the data gathered, correct? Now, if the information gathered reveals that the hypothesis is true, then it is accepted. Otherwise, it is rejected. So in studies where there are no expressed hypothesis, but only specific questions are used, then the data that should be gathered are those that would answer the questions. For example, if the question asked is, how qualified are the teachers handling science subjects? So only the data that deal with the degree earned by the teachers, their fields of specialization, their eligibilities, the seminars and special trainings attended, and the level of their mastery of the subject matter should be collected. And this data will answer the question whether the teachers are qualified or not to teach the subject science, okay? And number five characteristic, it should be free from all kinds of bias, meaning it should not suggest what should be the replies. So here is an example of a bias question. Are you using happy toothpaste? If not, what brand of toothpaste are you using? Okay, so why is it biased then? So this is a biased question because the mere mention of the word happy is already a suggestion. So to remove the bias, the question should be, what brand of toothpaste are you using? All right, so that should be uh, the question that should be written by the researcher to avoid bias. And number six, it must contain only questions or items that are unequivocal. So what do I mean by this? Take note that an equivocal, an equivocal question admits two or more interpretations, while an unequivocal question admits only one interpretation. So in order for us to better understand the differences between the two, here is an example of an equivocal question. Are you employed or not? So this is also called a double-barreled question. Actually, these are two questions rolled into one. So the first question is, are you employed? The second question is, are you not employed, correct? Now, the original question is answerable by yes or no, but the yes or no should be qualified. So the answer should be either yes, I am employed, or no, I am not employed. Are you employed is an example of an unequivocal question because the answer expected is definite either yes or no, right? When were you born is another example of an equivocal question. Now take note, the respondent may give only the month and the day of the month, or he may give only the year, or he may give the whole and exact date. So to make the question unequivocal, ask for the exact datum needed. So if only the year of birth is needed, then ask, in what year were you born? So if the complete data of birth is needed, then state, give the complete data of your birth. All right. So number seven characteristic of a good research instrument, that would be, it must contain clear and definite directions to accomplish it. What do we mean by this? Um, in order for us to better understand this, let me give you an example. So for example, for a poor direction, please accomplish the questionnaire, okay? So the respondent does not exactly know what to do, whether to write his replies in words, in numbers, or in other symbols. So the better direction is, this is a multiple response questionnaire. 
please read each question carefully and then put a check mark before the item or items following which you think will best answer the question. All right. So that is a better direction compared to the first example. Okay. And number eight characteristic if the instrument is a mechanical device, it must be of the best or latest model, meaning if it is a microscope or camera or a tape recorder, then it must be of the latest model so that it will gather accurate and reliable data. And for number nine characteristic, it must be accompanied by a good cover letter, meaning a good cover letter in the form of a request should be made as cordially and politely as possible to make the instrument more acceptable to the respondents. And finally, it must be accompanied, if possible, by a letter of recommendation from a sponsor. So a letter of recommendation from a sponsor, one who has some influence over the respondents, may be secured and made to accompany the instrument to facilitate its administration or to ensure its accomplishment and return. All right, I think that's a good place to stop. If you have questions, please let me know on the comment section below. And if you like this video, please don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell button for the latest updates. Thank you.